What are metamorphic rocks and how do they form? Metamorphism, it literally means after change, and it refers to the alteration or the morphing of pre-existing sedimentary and or igneous rocks after they've been exposed to high temperatures and really, really, really high pressures and extremely hot fluids. After these pre-existing or parent rocks have morphed, we call them metamorphic rocks. Most metamorphic rocks are classified using the rock's texture or a combination of the texture plus the mineral composition. So let's take a look at the texture first. High temperatures and pressures cause the parent rock's original texture to change and become foliated. Foliation, it refers to the flat or planar texture that sort of looks like layering. So as an example, sedimentary shales, which contain abundant particles of clay, will turn into a metamorphic rock called slate, which we've all heard about. This happens when the shale is compressed from two opposite directions, and we call this differential stress. This compression and the pressure causes the microscopic clay minerals to recrystallize into the minerals biotite, chlorite, and or muscovite, as well as some other minerals as well. And these minerals are really, really flat and platy, and they often have a shiny luster. Now, because of those tiny little flat platy mineral sheets, slates can be split along very flat planes, which is why a lot of people use them uh, for roof tiles and for billiard tables. As the slate continues to get buried deeper and deeper in the earth, the differential stress, which remember is from two different directions, uh, and the temperatures become even greater, and then more and more of the original clay minerals will turn into these other minerals, like biotite, chlorite, and muscovite. And this gives the rock a slight satin sheen, and it also causes those very flat, platy textures to crinkle just a little bit. And it's at this point that we call the rock a phyllite. As the temperatures and pressures continue to increase, some of the newer minerals combine with other elements and other minerals and they recrystallize into the mineral of garnet, which is a beautiful ruby red gemstone. Now at this stage, the foliation becomes really crinkly and wavy and the rock gives off a beautiful silver luster that with the addition of the garnet crystals makes it really distinctive. Now we call these metamorphic rocks schists. Now I found this beautiful example just lying around in a creek bed, which means you can too. Now, you're probably thinking to yourself, I see a theme here, and you'd be correct. As metamorphic rocks continue to change with increasing temperatures and pressures, we say that its metamorphic grade increases. Slate would be considered a very low metamorphic grade, phyllite would be considered sort of low to medium, and schist would be considered a higher grade metamorphic rock. That's because the minerals in the schist would be very different than the parent rock from which they originally came. The highest grade metamorphic rock is called gneiss because the minerals in the rock are completely different to the parent rock. Gneisses possess this very, very distinctive black and white banding, which results when less dense and lighter minerals like quartz and feldspar separate from denser and darker minerals like biotite and amphibole. Now, so far, we've only looked at the foliated metamorphic rocks, slate, phyllite, schist, and gneiss, but there is a, another group called the non-foliated metamorphic rocks, well, because they don't have any foliation. Now, this group of metamorphic rocks essentially forms in the presence of high temperatures, but very little pressure because they form close to the Earth's surface. Remember, it's the differential stress that gives foliated metamorphic rocks that special texture. Now, the two most important types of non-foliated metamorphic rocks are marble and quartzite, uh, both of which form in the presence of something called contact metamorphism. Contact metamorphism usually occurs when magma intrudes the surrounding sedimentary or igneous rock. The magma heats up the rock and essentially just bakes it. The localized zone of baking is called the aureole, and it's within that zone that the non-foliated metamorphic rocks form. 
When common limestone, for example, is baked, the calcite crystals get welded together, producing the metamorphic rock marble, which when polished is used to decorate home interiors, especially in the kitchen and the bathroom, and you probably have some of that rock in your home. Importantly, the calcite minerals don't change into other minerals, as often occurs in the foliated metamorphic rocks. They are the same minerals, they're just welded together. Quartzite is another non-foliated metamorphic rock that comes from sandstone. Again, like the calcite in the marble, the sand grains, which are really just tiny quartz crystals, they don't change into another mineral. They merely get welded together. And this makes quartzite a very durable substance. It's also why it's used in cements and in road construction. Now, because of its durability, quartzite ends up being one of the sole surviving rocks removed from creek beds that are then used to beautify your garden. Next time you see one, pick it up and look closely for impact marks. This is why these rocks are so smooth and why quartzites tend to be the rocks that survive from long trips from the mountains. The quartzites simply pulverize everything else that gets in its way. Okay, it's time now for our creation fact of the week. Did you know that the growth rate for some metamorphic minerals is thought to be very slow? Consider this statement from a well-known textbook on geology published very recently. When garnet crystals taken from a metamorphic rock collected in Vermont were analyzed, scientists calculated a growth rate of 1.4 millimeters per million years. Wow, 1.4 millimeters per million years. I mean, that's exceptionally slow. Uh, this would mean that a, a 15 millimeter diameter garnet would take about 11 million years to grow. Yet, this paper published in 2012 suggests that garnets could actually have grown much, much faster. In this paper, scientists dated both the core and the rim of two large garnets with a diameter of about 15 millimeter. Let's take a look at their data. They said this, combining acid cleansed garnet data from each garnet, multi-point garnet matrix isochron ages, just radioisotope dating, of 46.5 plus or minus 0.8 million years for the core, and 46.46 plus or minus 0.59 million years for the rim were determined. Now, these data surprised the scientists because the ages of both the core and the rim are, geologically speaking, almost the same. Uh, this becomes most evident when you take the uncertainties into consideration. Notice that the ages of the core and the rim overlap. This suggests, therefore, that these garnets could have formed basically instantly. And this isn't my interpretation. The authors went on to say this. The difference in age between the core and the rim, multi-point isochron ages, is 0.04 million years. That's only 40,000 years, though with larger uncertainty. Propagating the two sigma age errors provides a maximum duration of garnet growth of 1.03 million years. But notice this next statement. Instantaneous growth is also allowable within our uncertainties. Well, what does all of this mean? Well, it means that some metamorphic crystals could possibly have grown very rapidly. But more importantly, and this is the take home for this week's video, it means that students of science must be critically, critically able to evaluate uh, categorical statements that appear in textbooks and that are vocalized by professors who are teaching at the rudimentary level in high schools and at community colleges. In other words, dig deeper into the scientific literature. Okay, and here's our text for the week. It's from Titus 3 verses 1 through 3, where Paul says this, remind them to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. When discussing creationism with unbelievers, do you avoid quarreling? Are you gentle and do you show perfect courtesy to all people? Unfortunately, this biblical attitude is very rare on most creationist or social media discussion pages where Christians seem to be more interested in winning arguments than winning people to Jesus Christ. Remember, we are Christians first. Our creationist convictions should only serve to answer the hope that is within us, 1 Peter 3.15. It should never be used to push people away 
from the gospel. Well, that's all for now with me, Dr. C on creation geology for beginners. You can find uh, more creationist resources from me, uh, both here and here. Uh, please don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for fast access to future videos. Thank you and goodbye.